Good morning and welcome to our Sunday service at Salem here on this Palm Sunday. A warm welcome to you if you're a regular member of our church, but an especially warm welcome to you if you're perhaps connecting with us for the first time or have only connected with us in recent weeks. I pray that each of us as we gather together in this way are going to know God's presence with us and are going to be blessed by God as we pray, as we read the Bible and as we hear what God might be saying to us through it today. Paul is now going to lead us in our prayers. Come, pilgrim people. Come to worship the liberator and peacemaker who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Come to worship, pilgrim people. Lord God, let us approach with shouts of praise. Hosanna in the highest. Let us draw close to you on this day that caused disturbance and disruption. Let us approach the throne of the one who came as a humble servant, who came to set us free, to change things forever. Hosanna to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Linda's now going to give us today's reading. It's taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, starting in verse 1 and reading through to verse 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. And tie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Thank you Linda. The lockdown I'm sure has been affecting us all in different ways. Uh, one of the challenges uh, in our house has been uh, how we best look after our two young children, how we keep them engaged with learning and how we make the best of our current circumstances as they are. Uh, we've been doing a lot of drawing, a lot of little craft projects, that sort of thing and, and sometimes uh, these go well and, and sometimes uh, not so much. Uh, perhaps the, the face on a, a drawing turns out wrong. Uh, maybe a, a brother accidentally knocks the table when some delicate craft project is happening. Uh, and as a parent, I find myself uh, very often offering uh, to help uh, our children. But the sort of help that I want to give is not always the sort of help my children want to receive. Uh, the help they want is often very specific, it's very limited. They want help, but they want to keep uh, control. They want to have things done uh, just so. Uh, they want help, but the help they want is help on their terms. Uh, but so far, we've uh, usually been able to find a way to, to fix whatever the problem is, and we're making the best of it uh, that we can. It's uh, 
a very natural reaction uh, for a child. Our reading it in Matthew looks at this moment when Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. Uh, the people welcome him, they want him to be king, but Jesus was a, a different sort of king to the one that they were expecting. The, the kingdom that King Jesus was establishing wasn't the sort of kingdom the people really understood. Uh, the help that King Jesus had come to give would ultimately be something that the people would reject. Uh, and the events just uh, a week later from this moment uh, where Jesus would be executed on a cross and would die. Uh, and of course, if you know the Easter story, you know that wasn't the end, that three days later God raised Jesus to life and that Jesus Christ is alive and well today and is still changing lives for the better. But just to put this uh, reading in a bit of context, when Jesus comes into the city uh, in this way that we read about in Matthew's Gospel, uh, what we're seeing is a very deliberate act on Jesus' part. He's very deliberately positioning himself as God's king, the Messiah, the, the anointed king who is coming to rescue and to restore God's people. Uh, Jesus chooses to travel on a cult, uh, fulfilling the prophet Zechariah's words, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The crowds in turn, they're shouting out Hosanna, which means, oh, save now or please save. Uh, the way that Jesus is being praised and honoured like this is like a king who's returning home after victory in war. Uh, the difference here is that Jesus' victories aren't battles against other people, but they've been battles against what was wrong and what was broken in the world. Uh, Jesus' victories that the people are celebrating are all the sick that he's healed, the blind eyes that he's opened, the people he's, who he's given freedom from oppression by demonic spirits, they're the hungry people who've been fed, they're the people who've been restored and made clean, and, and Jesus has made a way for them to come back into their community. Jesus' victories are the ways in which he has so powerfully uh, and obviously demonstrated the reality of God's kingdom, of God's love and mercy made real. Uh, the Jewish people at this time, however, were hoping for a, a very specific sort of king that was a little bit different. Uh, they wanted a, a warrior king, one who would defeat the Romans, this pagan army that was occupying their nation. They wanted a, a righteous king who would restore proper worship of God in the nation and proper worship in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. They wanted a, a political king like the great King David who would rule with justice and, and righteousness. But Jesus was a different sort of king. Jesus' uh, battle was not with the Romans. Jesus' battle, the Bible tells us, was with the power of sin and death, a battle that he would win at the cross. Jesus uh, would be uh, that king who would revitalize the spiritual life of the people, but not just for the Jewish people. He would make a way for all people to come and worship God in spirit and in truth. And he would make a way for God's spirit to live in each of our hearts so that we would be, in the Bible's words, the temple of God. Jesus came to rule as king over people, but not with some political power that uh, we see in the world around us that demands obedience. But Jesus came to rule through people choosing of their own free will to surrender their lives to him as a response to his great love. The people who are on this day welcome Jesus. A few days later would abandon or reject him. They wanted a king, but they wanted a king on their terms, not Jesus's terms. What about us, uh, I wonder? Are we guilty of uh, wanting Jesus on, on our terms? Yeah. Are we, uh, how much do we say, Jesus, uh, I want your help in this part of my life, but, but with the rest, I'll, I'll keep control uh, of that. In our hearts, we keep areas, uh, things very dear to us, sometimes closed off to God, closed off to Jesus, maybe because we think it will be too challenging, maybe 
too painful or too costly to let Jesus be king over that area of our lives? These sort of questions are big and important ones that uh, everyone who wants to be a follower of Jesus will face again and again as we continue in that. Do we want Jesus on his terms or ours? I think part of the reason this is sometimes difficult for us and that we can struggle with letting Jesus be the king that he wants to be is is that we often forget what Jesus promises will be ours if we do make him king, king over our whole lives, holding nothing back. This is important because Jesus had some very good news for us about if we do make that decision to make him king and to keep him as king over our lives. And it's not just those wonderful things about life after death, but about God's promises to help us practically in the here and now. We're going to hear a little of Jesus' words a little earlier from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 6. If you want to turn to it in your Bibles, we're going to start reading Matthew chapter 6 from verse 25, where we hear Jesus say this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is God's promise to us through Jesus, that our Father in heaven knows we have practical needs, real day-to-day needs and necessities. And God himself promises us that if we seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, he'll make sure that our practical needs are met. Many of us will, I'm sure, have experienced at different points in life when God has provided for our practical needs, Uh, Maybe those things that just seem a bit too coincidental, a bit too just in time. Those answers to our prayers uh, over very practical and everyday problems and challenges. That sort of answer to those prayers we call God's uh, providence. That outworking of God's generosity and his desire to care for us in our daily lives. It's something we're seeing a great deal at the moment through the work of the food bank at Salem. As we, as a church together, have sought God's kingdom purposes in this time of providing food for people who need it, uh, and as the need for that in our community has grown because of all the problems we've had with coronavirus, the restrictions on our our movements, the many uh, people who have to remain uh, socially distant uh, within their, their houses and can't come out, We've seen God do amazing things. We've seen God provide some fantastic volunteers from the community at just the right time that we've needed them. We've seen God move on on people's hearts uh, in a really wonderful way, uh, moving on their hearts with generosity in a way that they have given not just their their time and energy, but they've donated practical goods uh, for the benefit of other people, donated food to be given out uh, for the food bank and other things. And as a church, as we continue to seek God's kingdom in this and other ways, we can do so with a confidence that we are going to see God provide for our needs time after time after time. And for each of us uh, today, uh, facing all sorts of practical challenges, whether it's uh, the practical challenges of being able to get the basic necessities from the shops or the challenge of staying positive and upbeat and full of uh, God's hope when we can't see our friends face to face or we can't chat to our neighbours as we've become used to. Whatever it is, whether it's a small thing or a big thing, we can take encouragement 
that God assures us that he knows exactly what our needs are and that he loves us and he cares for us and that if we are willing to seek first his kingdom, seek to put Jesus as king over our whole lives, then he promises to help and to provide for those things that we need. Let me invite you to pray now, and if you're willing, to invite Jesus once more to be the king over your life. Let us pray. King Jesus, whether we're doing this for the very first time, or whether we're simply restoring you to your rightful place in our hearts, Lord Jesus, now, we invite you to be king. Come take the highest place in our lives. Come take charge over all of us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come fill us now. Fill us with your presence, that we might know that you're with us right now. And that we might receive the peace that your word promises, passes all understanding. A peace that only you can bring. Fill us now, we pray. And Father, thank you for your promises to provide for us. We thank you that you are a good and generous Father and that nothing is impossible for you. We ask you that as each of us faces all sorts of practical challenges and needs in the day ahead and as we face them together as your church, that we would find you again and again to be faithful to your word and faithful to your promises. Amen. As we leave this place, let us celebrate the King, the Liberator, the Servant, the One who caused disturbance. And let us do the same. Amen.
our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.